Um, hello, everyone. My name is Murat. I'm Stanford scientist. I'm also co-founder of Magnumine Academy. We're based in Bay Area, Silicon Valley. And uh, so I myself, um, I was a particle physicist and then become biophysicist and bioengineer later. And I've been doing a lot of medicine. Now I am doing fully, not fully, all medicine using data science and diagnostic devices. I also develop data diagnostic devices and I apply machine learning deep learning models in my technologies. And in Magnumine Academy, what we've been doing, we're trying to first uh, in, uh, increase the awareness for the data science and provide a lot of events and uh, activities for people. And as I mentioned earlier, we have 11,000 just from the meetup groups, I believe is the more active one. And we've been doing online. A lot of people actually moved away from meetups since COVID because meetups are good for the in-person interaction. But we moved that uh, we moved to online. People don't realize that meetups can be online too. And uh, so we have online events. You guys learn from that. And oh, we you organize over hundred events last year. We do workshops, we do different uh, uh, different talks like that. And we do also some mini boot camps. We have a lot of free events. Last year alone, we hosted 16,000 people in our events. And it is a great number, 16,000 people. We give free uh, information and we are the most active meetup group in Bay Area. Actually meetup groups activities has declined a lot and recently. So, um, so please follow up, uh, follow us in, uh, in different channels. We have a YouTube channel. We have recordings all these sessions. And uh, we have, well, now we are opening a clubhouse. We're gonna have a live, more interactive session in the clubhouse. Please just sign up for our group. And may, if you search Magnumine and Clubhouse, get registered there. And uh, we're gonna have a clubhouse sessions. It will give us, give you more, um, more interactive sessions. And uh, you can sign up also in our meetup groups. Uh, I think most of you coming from there. Um, we have, we are gonna, or we are organizing, we haven't launched yet. We are organizing another series of free mini boot camps. It's around the 10, 12 hours lecture series. And uh, one in Python, one will be in uh, machine learning. So those sessions, we give the really the um, basics of that that thing, uh, Python and machine learning. It really helps a lot of people just get started with it or just improve themselves in that. And um, we are, we are gonna launch more events. We're gonna have a data science career talks, AI healthcare talks. We have done a lot last year. We're starting again. Um, also, if you guys are interested in giving a talk, we have a, a self-nomination uh, forum. Please just go ahead and just write all this information. If you wanna give talk about anything, uh, we are screening through and we just, uh, we are happy to host you. If you guys are talking, want to talk about data science or anything around it, and you're welcome to also introduce your company and, and give more technical information about it, help you know that as well. And today, uh, I would like to um, talk about our uh, guest, uh, uh, guest speakers. Uh, are from JFrog uh, company. And we have here Ari, Fred, and Mata. And I will, um, I have the, actually the background information about uh, Fred and Matan here. I will talk about that. Ari, you're welcome to also add yours or also Fred and Matan's if I miss anything. So Fred uh, Simon is the, uh, the co-founder, chief data scientist of JFrog. Uh, is a maker of the database of DevOps and the co-author of Liquid Software, how to achieve trusted continuous updates in the DevOps world. Uh, before founding J, uh, JFrag, he co-founded Alpha CSP, the Java consulting firm. 
1998, where he was the company's global CTO. It's fantastic background. And his professional development experience goes back to 1992 and covers Java technologies evolution from day one as a programmer, architect, and consultant. Just you look very young for that much <laughs> achievements or you started when you were a baby, I'm curious. <laughs> That's a fantastic background. So Matan is uh, prior to heading to data science practices at JFrog, Matan was the leader of AI group at IBM Professional Services. He was responsible for developing AI and ML solutions for a variety of enterprise customers. As part of role, he designed and implemented multiple first of AI a kind AI solutions such as the first worldwide AI assistance via WhatsApp channel, a unique orchestration platform for supporting multiple AI assistant conversation in a single chat sessions. In 2019, Matan took a major part in establishing the BI and analysis platform of Israeli National Cybersecurity Center. He holds, uh, he holds a master's degree in big data and data mining. That brings me, you guys have really diverse background. And I was asking Ari that, why don't you also come to call, uh, I mean, Clubhouse and people would like to benefit from your background. And I was just promoting that. Uh, we could organize separate event in Clubhouse if you guys are interested. I'm not paid by Clubhouse, but I can see very dynamic environment that it provides good interactive sessions with the people who has a great background like yours. And it, it, it gives, uh, it also attracts the really good people like your background. It could bring a good dynamics. So that's why we have also a different environment in, as a magnumine in Clubhouse. So I don't wanna take long and like the, Ari, do you wanna add anything to what I said or you like to talk about a little more introduction before Fred and Nathan starts. Hey. Sure, I really appreciate sure. that. And uh, you, really, you really did get to the good, you really did get to uh, uh, the great stuff that we're gonna be hearing a lot more about and uh, I'm honored to be here with uh, these great minds. Um, but uh, I'm Ari Waller and I am the Meetup Event Manager on the JFrog um, Developer Relations Team. And uh, we're really excited again to be here today. Um, to hear from Fred and Matan. I know they've got some, a really great talk to share uh, for, for the community. Um, I'm gonna share a slide just really quick because we are doing a little bit of a giveaway um, that I thought would be of, uh, that we thought would be of interest um, to some people. And I think it'll also be mentioned again. So if you don't catch it, um, if you don't catch it this time, but uh, just a little bit about, about who JFrog is. JFrog, we are a DevOps software company um, known best for Artifactory, which is considered by many to be the gold standard for managing your artifacts and dependencies. We've been in existence for over 12 years. We have 10 offices globally and more than 3 million DevOps engineers and developers use our software tools on a daily basis. Uh, for today, uh, we have a raffle. Uh, we're gonna be giving away uh, 10 JFrog t-shirts and a liquid software book. We're gonna make it a combo so 10 people are gonna win both of those. Uh, we have uh, also to note that Fred Simon is one of the co-authors of the Liquid Software book. So you can scan the QR code or I'll drop the bit.ly into the chat um, as well. And um, winners are gonna be selected within two business days and we will contact you via email uh, to inform you and then uh, share it of course with the uh, uh, the, the, your meetup page as well. But uh, again, thank you so much for having us today. And um, I'm going to uh, close my screen so we can get to the great stuff in the talk, Marat. And thank you so much again. Uh, you're welcome. Hey. Hi, guys. Um, so yeah, like uh, Mel said, I'm uh, Fred Simon, um, and I'm uh, yeah, I'm uh, writing software uh, since the age of ten. So that's uh, maybe that helps for the, for the age. Um, and uh, since then, um, like I said, uh, like, like I used to say, trying to make a machine uh, understand what I want and uh, make it uh, behave correctly. 
uh, takes a lot of time and energy. Uh, just uh, for uh, background also in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, um, my uh, first job as an internship uh, when I went out of school, uh, it was in uh, 92, uh, was to do uh, uh, a, a network, um, a neural net uh, to try to uh, classify uh, and uh, to control a big um, steel and a steel factory uh, and um, the um, improvement in uh, AI and ML and uh, the improvement in model learning since then is just uh, amazing and just it took us about a week to train one model uh, just uh, on, the, on the big computer. Um, it changed a lot since then. <laughs> so can you move? Um, yeah, can you move to the next slide? Nathan? So um, I like to start with a, with a small joke because I think it's uh, really, really important for uh, what um, we are trying to do here. And uh, one of the main uh, change of thinking, uh, which uh, we are seeing today. So uh, the thing is that um, I don't know how many of you know uh, what is uh, the three main uh, the three main secrets of uh, French cuisine. So uh, if some of you knows uh, what are the three main secrets of French cuisine, you can uh, raise your hand. <laughs> but uh, basically the joke is that uh, the secrets are butter, butter, and butter. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, related really well to uh, what we are doing at JFrog, which is uh, DevOps and uh, DevOps automation. And uh, basically the three main secrets of uh, DevOps, which is the uh, ability to set up a process that enable you to release fast, to release new version faster and faster. And the three secrets of DevOps is basically, um, you can click, automate, automate, and automate. And everything is about automation. Everything is about uh, how can I actually make a machine do a lot of what I'm doing uh, and uh, make it do again and again the same thing uh, that what I'm doing. And so the, the feedback loop here in, uh, in AI and ML is um, very interesting and, and very kind of uh, uh, bizarre. And by the way, the developer, they had the same issue also. You could be a developer interacting with the machine, writing code and making a machine do uh, basically what, uh, what it's programmed to do and what it's uh, supposed to do. And uh, still every morning you go in, you copy a file here, you uh, cut a piece of data and, and put it on S3, uh, you run uh, six commands and you do that again and again. And every morning you just do again and again the same thing. And uh, it sounds very, very bizarre that basically we, we see that we are repeating ourselves, that we are doing the same task again and again, and we don't, uh, spend the time wait, maybe I should automate this stuff. And from time to time, this is um, happening over and over, over the, the life of all software, not only uh, AI and ML. It's, uh, there are some people that decided, okay, I'm tired of it. I'm going to create a platform, an open source tool. This is what happened to Linux with Git to actually create a platform that helps us uh, develop software faster by automating a lot of the processes and a lot of the things we are doing. And uh, in the uh, AI and uh, ML environment, we still in a lot of the research, I mean, the, the amount of uh, research to find a good feature, to do uh, uh, feature engineering, to uh, train the model correctly, to find the good parameters. There is so much research that need to be done, so much uh, manual things that need to be done that um, we feel like we are not at the stage or at the edge of automation. And what we find out is that it's, it's actually not true. And I, I think some of you already started to use, so what is called uh, ML ops for machine learning ops, but even in AI and, and the environment. And um, so at JFrog, what uh, we started to do is uh, first of all, we find a, a great tool and, and a company that is kind of helping us build some of this automation, which is Valo High. So 
So we use the valorhigh.com product to, uh, to help us automate um, a lot of the model building and a lot of the uh, research uh, environment um, together. So it's basically multiple people and uh, multiple uh, data science uh, research uh, operation can be done together on the same platform and also multiple version. And this is the main thing is that uh, a lot of time what we find is that you work really hard to, uh, to clean up the data, to find the, the good feature, to train the model, to find the good and you get really good, um, really good number and, and really good feedback from, from your model. And then you want to give it to production and you put it to production. And of course, one of the first things a lot of time that happens is that just by putting the, the model in production and Matan is gonna talk about it, you actually influence the feedback. The data start to change. People start to act based on uh, what you are giving. So it's actually changed the feedback loop and it's changed the data. So you have to retrain the model. You have to uh, uh, find a new, new parameter, a new way. And so a model is never static. It needs to be uh, re-updated and, and, uh, and change over time. And you need automation to be able to uh, uh, securely and repeatedly uh, uh, redeploy without having to uh, redo uh, a, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And there is a lot of manual work here that can be automated in this loop of uh, data extraction, training, and deployment and test. And um, like I said before, this loop now is you can actually find pattern, and this is the next stage that uh, we want to do with. Uh, uh, Matan and it's it's to actually find pattern in the way people are versioning any kind of software and find pattern in the way people are deploying and doing this loop and this DevOps loop of continuous improvement and continuous delivery and uh, keep doing it. And so there is here again uh, a feedback loop between the AI and ML. And so the what the Matan is going to present you here is. Um, how we uh, started to use this uh, methodology and this thinking of uh, keep um, monitoring and, and managing all kind of uh, parameters and, uh, and um, uh, model uh, um, to look deep into the model and how the model uh, was, uh, was actually uh, created. What are the features that are important? If there is big change, for example, from one version to another, there is probably something that went wrong and so on. So Matan, up to you. Okay, thank you very much, Fred, and uh, hi, everyone. So I'm going to use the next, like Fred said, the next 20, 25 minutes uh, to talk with you about two real world use cases that we solved and actually still solving in JFOG. Uh, the first one would be classifying the maturity of customers in their DevOps journey. And basically what it means is being able to look at one specific customer and then um, classify it, classify its DevOps journey. For example, if someone is a beginner in his DevOps journey, maybe he's a, an advanced user. And then based on this classification, try and see if there are any gaps between um, the way that this specific customer is using our product. So one example could be someone that is using a very light uh, um, subscription of the product, but on the other hand, he is very mature in his DevOps journey, then this could be someone that uh, we might be want to, to be talking to and ask him uh, maybe to move to a higher tier. Maybe it's more relevant for him to better utilize the tools uh, that are more relevant to his uh, uh, dev, DevOps status. So this is the first, the first uh, use case that I will talk about. The second one is a prediction of customer usage patterns and alert on anomalies. And this project is basically, I mean, the goal behind this project is to be able to notify our customers uh, when they have uh, special anomalies in their data, when they're not using the product properly, we want to be able to, to act on it on time and also be able to uh, predict one, two, three months ahead um, the usage of the, of the, uh, uh, the usage of the product. And basically by predicting it, this gives us a whole um, set of options and things to do, things like um, assessing a customer health. If someone is um, 
having a, 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 for example, a good trend over time, if someone is having a negative trend, if someone suddenly has multiple anomalies, this is something that we can um, uh, use in order to improve the way that they use the product. And eventually we'll talk about um, deployment and monitoring aspects, meaning how we keep our models uh, in high quality once, once we put them in production. So some part of the things that I'm going to show you are already implemented. Some of them um, are being worked on. So uh, let's begin with talking about the first model. <clears throat> so the first one, like I said, is the DevOps journey model. Uh, I'm going to start actually with the output. So what you're seeing uh, in the right side is actually what our uh, sales, sales reps are seeing, the guys from the sales. And we basically wanted to answer the following question. Do we need to propose a customer to move to a more advanced tier? So for example, like I said, if someone is using um, a subscription of our po a product that is called JFOG Pro X, which is relatively uh, a medium type subscription, and we know that the DevOps maturity is very high, then we want to be able to, um, to reflect it to the salesperson. So this is what they will see. They will see uh, a special field that is populated by our, our model. And this field will actually tell them that the upsell rating is high, meaning that this customer will probably need to be uh, talking to him and ask him, uh, do you want to move to the next tier based on your usage? It looks like uh, um, you could be utilizing our product better and use more features. And um, basically, like I said, the goal behind it is um, giving the best options to our customers based on their usage. Now, the second thing we provide uh, for the reps, uh, which relates to what Fred said, is another field that's called upsell feedback. So let's say, for example, that we uh, marked this specific customer. Sorry. Let's say that we marked this specific customer as high. And then there was actually a conversation between uh, the customer and the sales rep. And in this conversa conversation, we found out that the customer is completely uh, not interested. So we want to be able to, to have this feedback and improve our model based on the feedback. And this is something that closes the entire uh, feedback loop and allows us to improve our models over time. But um, I think the most important thing that we provide to our sales rep is not just the prediction, not just the, the high, medium, or low score for, for every customer, but we also provide them something that we call explainability. So we don't just give them the score, we tell them the why. So if we say hi, we want to tell them why the model decided to classify the specific customer as high. So this is, again, an actual screen from Salesforce, which is the system that our sales reps are using. Uh, you can see in the right side, some features have green color. Some of them have, uh, in this case, it's only one, but red color. Uh, the red ones means these are the features and the values that made the model decide that this probably needs to be uh, a lower maturity customer, a lower DevOps maturity customer. The green ones are meaning that uh, these are the ones that pushed the model to decide that this needs to be uh, a higher um, maturity customer. So for example, in this example, the fact that this specific customer has uh, a very high quality of experience, of customer experience, and the number of training that he did with the JFrog is relatively high. And he uses many technologies uh, in comparison to, uh, to other uh, customers that are uh, similar to him, and, and so on and so on. Um, for example, a bad feature could be the fact that the number of contacts is only two. So we are only talking with two people from this company, which is relatively low for similar customer, customers. And all of this is grouped together and giving us the score, but it's also giving the rep, uh, the sales rep, the ability to have a much more educated, a much more efficient call uh, with the customer. So the conversation don't just start with, do you want to upgrade, but we're seeing your usage, we're seeing uh, the pattern that you're using. Um, we can also tell you how, you, uh, how you're using in comparison to other similar customers. And based on that, we think that you might need to consider moving um, to a better product, moving to more, more features, a higher subscription. Um, and I think that the combination between um, the classification and the why is actually giving us the power to push our customers to, to better use our products. Uh, just in case you wondered, uh, in order to produce this, we used a, a package in Python that's called CHAP. 
uh, which is very powerful. And, and if you're not familiar with it, I suggest that you have a look. Uh, in terms of inputs of the model, so you all understand that this is a, a machine learning model. And in this specific case, we used CutBoost, mainly because we saw that it's beating the other traditional models, things like uh, Random Forest and XGBoost. They were a little bit uh, weaker in terms of performance. But this is not the only reason. Actually, CatBoost has many advantages. So some of them uh, is the fact that you don't have to deal with labeling and missing values. Most of those things are already being taken care of uh, inside the model. And these are some example features. The actual model has 100 features, but some examples. So we look at, per customer, we look at uh, the website visits. So if you're visiting in our more advanced documentation pages, versus our less advanced documentation pages. Uh, docu yeah, documentation pages. And we're looking at uh, events that you attended, webinars that you're attending. We're also analyzing free text to see if you mentioned things like high availability, um, uh, multi-site replication, things that usually relate to uh, a higher level of DevOps uh, journey consumption. Uh, we also look at your location. We look at the usage pattern, are you a heavy user or maybe uh, not so heavy user? Which technologies are you using? How many repositories do you have? All of this is taken into account into the model. We're also using some third party uh, uh, companies that they give us uh, another layer of data, things like uh, if the company that you're coming from is public versus not public, how many employees you have in the company, even how many uh, DevOps engineer have in your company. Of course, this data is never complete and it's never perfect, but still this is something that you can easily incorporate into a model and get uh, a pretty good uh, uh, benefit. And eventually, like I said, the output is the DevOps maturity of a customer. And this gives us the ability to just push customers to the right subscription based on the behavior. Now, I didn't mention it uh, in the previous slide, but one second, let me, Okay, uh, but the, the list of features that you're seeing here is actually being built uh, uh, specifically for every different customer. So if this specific customer had this set of features, it doesn't mean that another customer will have the same features. It's being uh, tailored for every customer and we only present um, 10 or 20 features per customer, only the most important ones. So the rep can really get the most important um, features and their values uh, based, on, uh, based on SHAP. The second model uh, is a very different model. Uh, this is actually a time series model. And like I said in the beginning, um, here the goal was a little bit different. So let me just describe this picture a little bit. So everything you see left to this yellow line is historical usage. This is how uh, a specific customer is using our product. So you can see, for example, that every uh, weekend you have those downs and then there is usage again and a weekend and so on and so on. And the goal is basically to try and predict the usage for the rest of the month and not just one month, but a uh, few months ahead. Uh, and while we're, do while we're doing it, uh, we noticed that we can also utilize it for more, more usages. So like I mentioned, for some customers, we can actually already predict the trend, the future trend, if it goes up, if it goes down. And based on that, we can build a, a company a health score. So if one customer has a very uh, negative trend, the health score will probably be negative. And this is something we can act on. We can uh, contact the customer. We can see uh, why things are going down. And on the other end, if someone is, go is going up, this is also someone to talk to and see if we can uh, help him to, uh, uh, to better use our product. Another thing that we are uh, uh, trying to identify are anomalies. So for example, let's say that the red part, the red line is the prediction, right? And the blue is the actual data. If we see that there is, uh, uh, a, a gap that is too big between the actual and the prediction, we usually identify it as anomaly. An anomaly can have multiple meanings. So for example, this anomaly could have the meaning that this specific customer is going to increase his usage and is going to stabilize on a new level of usage, a higher, a higher level. 
but there could be other cases as well. It, it could be um, maybe the customer did some kind of mistake with the product. Maybe he's not using the product properly and causing himself to, um, to create a, a huge peak of usage while not really utilizing the product uh, properly. And this is something also that we want to be able to track and notify our customers uh, on time. Uh, by the way, um, like I said, this is a, a time series uh, model. We've tried multiple approaches. So we've used LSTM uh, implemented in PyTorch. We've used Facebook Profit and we've used Holt Winters, which is a more classical um, approach. Uh, feel free to write in the chat which approach you think was the most successful out of those uh, three approaches. LSTM, Facebook Profit or Holt Winters? Nobody wants to, to say which one they like. <laughs> Nobody has an idea. Okay, so I can tell you that. Oh, they, 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 they don't want to say the, which one. Ah, Let's one guy, Facebook. Oh, cool. Okay. Facebook profit. Okay, so actually we started with, uh, with Holt Winters because Holt Winters is, I think, is the easiest out of, the, out of those three. Um, basically, there aren't too many parameters that you can tune. And Facebook Profit is, uh, is like a, a very complicated, uh, I mean, there are so many options to, to play with and it's getting complicated as, as you dive in. Uh, LSTM as well. Um, the more we used, the more we, we tested, we found out that actually the traditional LSTM uh, implementation with a few adjustments is actually beating Facebook Profit and Holt Winters. Uh, so this is what we chose eventually, LSTM. This was the winner. Uh, and this was, this was the input for the LSTM. So uh, basically three, three inputs. The first one is historical daily usage data, which is the graph that you saw for every day, the, the amount of usage. Um, we also, uh, um, for every day that, was, that is a holiday, uh, we also mentioned if it's a holiday or not, specifically per, per day, and also if it's a weekend or not a weekend. So these were the only features of the model. And like I said, the output is the, the predictions, and we actually have a, a very accurate prediction uh, using this LSTM model. Uh, so now some open questions we've had uh, while we, uh, started working on those models. So the first question was, which tools do we want to use in order to build the model? Uh, which data do we need? And do we have all the data that we need? Uh, what kind of verification points and tests do we need to, to create? And how we can eventually evaluate and monitor our model over time? So regarding the tools, we decided to go with Python and Jupyter, mainly because Python is open source. Uh, it's cross-platform and in JFOG we use multiple platforms. Uh, it's a high level uh, language. It means that the code is much more readable and sometimes also easier to, to, to write. It can be used on multiple domains. So in Python, basically you have a package for everything, unlike uh, other languages like R, which sometimes you need to actually enrich it with, with, with Python in order to, to get some uh, functionalities. And in Jupyter, not all of the team is actually using Jupyter. This is um, flexible to choose from, but uh, in my mind, Jupyter simplifies the process of data science workflow because it gives you the ability to, to tell a story in a notebook rather than just writing uh, uh, the code. Eventually, once, once the notebook is ready, you have to convert it to, uh, to a Python code anyway. So uh, this is something that needs to be taken into account. Regarding the data, so uh, um, we've had uh, uh, multiple data, um, multiple data uh, uh, sources that we needed to, to connect to. So one example is uh, free text. We needed to take uh, our emails because the model is uh, looking at emails and, and extracting specific uh, topics from those emails. So we needed to create continuous data flow from documented emails, uh, which updates uh, daily. The second thing is creation of, we call it point-in-time snapshot. This is um, 
more related to the LSTM model than the first cut boost that I spoke about. But the idea behind it is to create uh, data sets, okay, data sets from different time frames. And once you have data sets from, diff from different times, time frames, you're actually able to test your model on multiple time frames and multiple configurations. I will speak about it in a second. And in order to do it, we use the tool that's called Alation. Alation is a tool that gives us the ability to um, create SQL queries and document them, share them, write description, and uh, um, move them between the team in a way that is uh, much more convenient than, uh, than just managing your SQL in your code. Uh, the second thing uh, we are now working on, which is verification and tests, how we make sure that the model doesn't fail or giving us the wrong prediction. So one way of doing it is implementing uh, uh, changes in features in feature importance. So feature importance is something that is not supposed to change over time. It's not supposed to, to, to be uh, to, to give you different results from one run to another run. So one thing you could do is, for example, track the changes. If you see that in run number one, feature number four was very important and feature number six was relatively low. And then when you run it one day after or one month after, suddenly the, the trend changes. Feature number four is very low and feature number six is very high. You can probably deduct that something wrong is happening in your data, in your input data, or maybe inside your model. And this is something you want to be notified and alerted on. So this is one thing. The second thing is implementation of tests of the input data. So usually in your models, you have categorical data or numerical data. So for the categorical data, you want to make sure that the number of categories and even the categories itself, itself uh, is not something that is changing from one run to another. For numeric data, you can track things like uh, um, the mean of the distribution and the standard deviation of the distribution. And if you see that the changes are too uh, radical from one run to another, this is something that you also need to be uh, alerted on. Of course, this needs to be adjusted to your data. So for example, if you have a feature that is uh, the age of your customers, you should expect that the, the median will move from one, um, from one run to another. But in many other cases, the mean should be uh, steady. And if you see a change, you should uh, be alerted on it. Evaluation and validation. So how do we compare different configurations? So uh, this, again, applies mostly for the LSTM. We did it mostly for the LSTM. We, we have used uh, the tool that's called Valohai. And this tool is giving us um, the ability to run a grid search on multiple parameters, on multiple uh, data snapshots that I spoke before, the, the different time frames uh, of data. So eventually you have, let's say, four or five different sets of data from different time frames. And for every one of them, you can run uh, uh, your grid search with multiple parameters. And for every configuration like this, you get uh, all of your measures, things like accuracy, recall, and precision. And this gives you the best, uh, the best picture of which configuration is best of, for your model. But the good thing about Valoi is that it gives you the ability to document everything, to share it with the team, and also be able to, to actually open the execution and see exactly what the notebook looked like the day you ran it with the data and everything. So this is a very big advantage uh, using Valoi. Uh, the fact that you can document everything everything is shared and everything can be uh, reproduced. Because you know, sometimes uh, you want to maximize a specific uh, measure for your model. It could be that one day you wanted to, to maximize your recall and you had a fixed value of precision, but something in the business happened and suddenly you need to adjust the level of your recall or the level of your precision. So you don't need to run again everything. You can just come back to Valohai and see the different results and just choose a different configuration that better fits to your new business needs. So this is really powerful and something that um, we're now extending the use. Uh, lastly, deployment and monitoring. So in terms of deployment, in most cases, our models are running on a batch process with a scheduled uh, timing twice a day on strategic hours. So strategic hours means that we're trying to um, to time the, the, the training and the running of the model before the day starts. So the business will have the most updated data. 
but we also do it in the middle of the day because we want to give them um, the updates during the day itself. Every time we, uh, we run the model, we retrain it again on new data. So like I said, twice a day, it's being retrained. In terms of monitoring, um, the users can actually see, we always provide the users the entire history and trend of our predictions. So for example, if I go back to the first CatPus model, where we give them the DevOps journey score, uh, if it's low, high, or medium, they can always see the, the history. They can know that, for example, two months ago, the journey that this specific customer was high in his journey, and then he moved down to maybe medium, and then he moved down one month after to low. And this is something that they can um, deduct from, and they can decide how, how they want to tackle it and maybe uh, check with the customer why, um, why they see a decline in the usage or an increase in the usage. Uh, the second thing is uh, deviations from the measure that you're, you're trying to maximize. So if your model has a specific set of performance, specific accuracy, recall, precision, F1 score, or whatever you're trying to maximize, and then su suddenly you have a big changes in your, um, in your uh, score, this is also something that must be monitored and, and must be, uh, you must create uh, uh, automatic alerts to be able to act on it on time. And lastly, like I mentioned, uh, feedbacks from the users. So eventually uh, the users can give you feedbacks that you cannot get from just by looking at recall precision, things that more relate to the business. And this is, I think this is a very important part of how you measure a model. So closing the feedback loop always needs to conclude uh, uh, live feedback from, from the model. And this is something uh, we always uh, uh, put in our models and I think is very important. Uh, so last but not least, um, like Ari mentioned, uh, feel free to go to this website if you want a t-shirt and if you have any questions and you want to ask, so again, feel free. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm done. If you have any question, please uh, feel free. quiet audience today. Yeah, I think uh, ah, we need to. Maybe you can write in the chat. Um, Morat, if someone wants to speak, do they have the ability to do it? Ah, someone is asking if you can show the scan again. Can you go back one, one slide? <laughs> Which one? Previous. This, yeah, this one. And, uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> you apply to the fit here. Yeah. So the JFrog has a, has a feature and um, you can. Okay, cool. Ari, do you want to wrap it up? Do you have anything to add or what? Thank you. Hello. Take more. Thank you for the, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for presentation. I hope it's helpful. Uh, do you, there is questions. Did you answer all those? Um, yeah. Beside the thank you, then. No, no. So ah, I yeah. guess you explain all these questions. Yeah. What? Um, yeah, there is an, a question from uh, from Anthony about the tool yeah. we use or the platform for reproducibility and history. So... Okay, yeah, so it really depends on the model. So for the history, it depends where the model is, where the output of the model is deployed. For example, uh, if we provide the score in Salesforce, we define specific field in Salesforce to, sell, to save history and then they 
the reps can see the history in Salesforce itself. Sometimes the models actually produce the results in a dashboard, so you can just see the results on a dashboard and everything is uh, saved in, in uh, the data, data warehouse. In terms of repos reproducibility, uh, our models are saved, the notebooks are saved in uh, uh, Valohai in a specific configuration, and this gives us the ability to run the exact same configuration if we want to change our, for example, our, uh, uh, our target, like, like focus on recall instead of precision or vice versa. That's great. Yeah, I just, uh, Anthony, I just answered it before, valohigh.com. Okay. Uh, what do you mean, what are notebooks saved in? The notebooks are saved in, in, a tool, in a tool that we use. It's called Valohigh. The execution itself is being saved in, in Valohigh. It's great. I guess this is all the questions. Yeah. Great. Appreciate your time, everyone's time. Um, so hopefully we're going to see everyone in next meeting. And also, uh, Fred and Maiten, if you guys want to have another event in different topics, welcome. we welcome to us here again. And the way of participants is really more than 90% of continues in like one hour. It's amazing. But they didn't drop out. <laughs> yeah, that okay. means it's good. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good bye -bye. time. Bye. Bye bye.